This is the eighth week of our seven-week series on seven things to totally do or definitely do to totally destroy your life. Now, if you have not been with us over the course of the series, it doesn't really matter. Each of these weeks is independent, but the series would be interdependent where we're working on a list, not given by Jesus in one of his messages or Paul in any of his writings, but by history and tradition, the uh, list of the seven deadly sins. We don't weigh or put too much weight on them as far as a a sin that would send you to hell or a worse sin than another, Um, but um, simply just areas in our life we need to look at to make sure that we're not exposed or weak or vulnerable. And my goodness, over the last seven weeks, I have found every week something to work on. Have you? Um, yes. Now we're going to be talking a little bit about lying today. So I just, the second half of our section of our time together, but um, you know, you thought that was a rhetorical question, but I mean, every single week, I mean, we've been talking about this list of seven things, seven things to definitely do to totally destroy your life. And, you know, as we look at it together, we dive right into it just as a, a matter of review. We started off with pride. Do you remember that? And then we followed it up with envy. Do you remember that? Then we followed it up with gluttony. My goodness, that was a week that we had so much conversation, still having conversation about that one. Lust, that came up yesterday when Dan was thinking about buying a new Corvette and his wife said, no, he wasn't thinking about that. Uh, It was a joke, but Lori texted in a group chat and said, you know, Dan, we covered lust a couple of weeks ago. Don't shop for anything while I'm gone. So it comes up all the time in our conversations and in our life, whether it's of a person, whether it's of things, uh, I'll tell you a story in the second half of our time together that even talks about, well, greed and lust combined and returning stuff from Amazon. And you'll hear it in just a minute. All right. So we started off with pride, then envy, then gluttony, then lust, and then anger. And then we talked about greed last week. Do you remember greed? That was a long time ago. That was seven days ago. Today, we're finishing up the list with sloth or laziness. And before you, I mean, I, I wish, I wish I had $10 $10 for every person who told me when I knew that the topic of this week was going to be laziness, I didn't think this applied to me. I didn't think I needed to hear it. I almost, well, you know, they didn't say skip church because that would be a weird thing to tell the preacher, but, you know, just sort of disconnected, just decided that I, it wasn't important. But today we're not going to be talking about a lack of motivation, a lack of drive, a lack of passion. Um, I know there's some people who probably wake up in the morning passionless, um, not really interested or driven to anything. And your goal for the day is to get through the day and just to continue to exist. And I know in some cases that's caused by a chemical reaction or a chemical situation, a depression that uh, a lot of times medication and counseling and treatment can help. But in general, in a person and all of us from time to time function in healthy ways and in all, many times we function in unhealthy ways, um, all of us should be passionate about something. We should have something that drives us, that brings out compassion, that motivates us to get up in the morning, whether it's a hobby, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a job, whatever it is, something that gives us a rhythm for the way that we live. And so I'm not thinking of you being a lazy person, just not wanting to get out of bed and just wanting to sit around and waste your time. And that's not at all what we're talking about. What I'm talking about today is spiritual laziness. And what I'm talking about today is when you know what you should do, but you just choose not to do it because it's just too hard. That is the kind of sloth or laziness that we're gonna dig into today. And that's what's been in my business all week. I can't wait to share it with you. As we cover a topic every week, and this is the last week, would you ask yourself, is this me? Ask yourself as you listen to this today. Not, I wish my wife or husband could hear this. Not, I need to share this with my friend. Not if my kids would just listen or my parents would just listen, but just ask yourself, is God saying anything? Is there anything God wants to say to me? And then have the courage to be honest with yourself, honest with God, perhaps even honest with somebody else, because this is a subject that can change your life. In our city groups this morning at the first hour and also going on right now, uh, the other side of the property, we have groups of people who are beginning their time together by asking this question. If I was going to totally ruin my life or your life with laziness, I would definitely do this. 
What would you tell yourself? What would you tell your wife or husband if you have one, your partner, your boyfriend, your girlfriend? What would you tell your kids? What would you tell your coworkers? How would you advise somebody to totally destroy their lives with laziness? Well, if you see any of that in you, we have to kill it because your relationship with God can be and should be amazing. I want us to start this time together with an assumption, a thought, perhaps even a conclusion that you have formed. What if the story that God is writing in your life is more beautiful than the story you've chosen to write for yourself? And what if the reason that you've chosen to take the pen and write your own story or to write the story for your family or your friends is because you just don't trust that God knows what he's doing and that what he's doing is better than what it is you find yourself so frustratingly hard trying to do. This is a subject today that as we cover it can set you free and allow God to pick up the pen and to continue writing. Well, laziness and procrastination are pretty close together, but they're not the same thing. So I want us to be clear as we dive into this subject. Um, procrastination is the voluntary delay of an intended act despite expecting to be worse off. So intending to do something, but just putting it off even though you know that the, the result is gonna be worse. Putting something on a credit card, saying that you're gonna pay it off you know, in 30 days and when it gets down to 30 days and you'd rather just take a little mini vacay and not pay off the credit cards. So you're gonna put the interest off to the next month knowing that you'll pay for it later. You just sort of procrastinate. That could hit a lot of different boxes over the last seven weeks. A, a person must intend to do something and then decide not to do it for the act to qualify as procrastination. For laziness, the definition is that a person's just genuinely disinterested, declined to inactivity or, or exertion, not energetic or even vigorous. And according to a study published in 2018 by the Journal of Human Arenas, laziness can be regarded as a failure to act or perform as expected due to conscious controllable factors, namely a lack of individual effort. What's that mean? Some of you have reasons in your life why you can't do what you know you should do. And they're genuine reasons. They're not excuses, they're reasons. Some of you have physical reasons, some temporary reasons, perhaps relationally or even financially, a season that could bring with it reasons. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about the decision to know, the awareness to know, and the choice just not to act. Just a lack of individual effort. Well, as we get sort of into this subject today, Jesus talked about this and he talked about it to his disciples. Now it's a passage of scripture that we've covered before, but it's always the, the passage that I focus on the beginning and the middle, but never the end. And the ending of this passage is really important because Jesus leaves a clue or a secret for his disciples. Now this takes place right when Jesus was getting ready to be arrested. I mean, it was like Thursday before the events of his you know, crucifixion, his resurrection all happened just within days. He gathered his disciples together for one last meal or meeting together. He was telling them you know, all the things he needed them to know before he was taken off. You know, you think about trying to brief your coworkers or your employees before you go on vacation. I mean, this is like Jesus pulling the guys that he has brought with him to trust with the gospel who still aren't getting it. And, and he's bringing them together one more time going, we're gonna eat a meal. We're gonna take our time. I wanna talk through, through some things with you. And he lays a clue out there. It's a massive Easter egg. And, and you know, many people don't find it because the story is just so powerful. We get caught up in it. So picture the disciples, they're gathering together. They've made their way into Jerusalem and, and they know that something's gonna happen, but they're not sure what. They still think that Jesus is gonna build a big castle, that he's gonna have a big moat, that he's gonna have a big army, that people who are selected to be in his cabinet will get to wear fancy hats and carry big sticks and have authority and robes and you know they'll have the position and they just don't understand what Jesus was all about. And so they think that to get the part, they have to look the part. 
They have to act the part. So they're trying to be important. And you say, well, how do you know that doesn't say this in John where we're going to be right now? It talks about it in Luke. And this story and these final events are repeated in the gospels because they're important. And as we read the book of Luke and inspired by the Holy Spirit tells us that the disciples, they had a lingering, uh, continuing conversation with each other. Kind of that undercurrent like your kids get when you're in the car and you're on a long trip and you just want them to be quiet. They're fighting, but you don't know quite what about. And you keep looking over your shoulder going, cut it out. But you're not sure exactly what they should cut out. And it wouldn't stop. Well, if we're going to be important, we need to act important. We need to audition for the job. Oh, we better dust off our clothes. We better go, you know, pick up something extra nice to wear. I got to make sure I get there early so I can park up, you know, close. And, and, you know, they were trying to posture, trying to convince. It was disgusting. They were arguing amongst each other who should be more important, whose resume was the best, who had the best track record, who'd pleased Jesus the most, who'd been the most faithful. And it was the opposite of where Jesus was heading. And so he did something to convince them of a truth, to teach them a truth, an object lesson. And many good teachers do things and use things they do to teach, not just words they say. And so Jesus wanted to show them, to give them a picture. Now, you know the story because we've talked about it before, but focusing on the ending is why I'm bringing this up right now. In the book of John, and I wanna read this to you, we know that Jesus had gathered his disciples together now, Jesus is descending into greatness. He's preparing to humble himself by allowing himself to be arrested, allowing himself to be tortured, allowing himself to be crucified, and then three days later, rising again. His disciples trying to ascend into greatness by proving that they deserve to be vice president and chief of staff and you know, the cabinet and the important people and the people that make the decisions. And so they're frantically trying to convince Jesus and each other that they should be elevated. Jesus is like, man, I gotta do something to, to show you guys so that you get it. So they all come in to eat, they're all dirty. They took a bath in the morning, you know, not in a shower with high water pressure and soap. But I mean, you know, some sort of a bath. That was the ritual. That was the custom. They were clean people. But they walked all day everywhere they went, wore sandals. You know the story if you've been around church any period of time. They got together. They began to eat together. When they eat, they recline at the table. They lay on their arm. Their feet are pointed the other direction because feet stink at the end of the day, even when they're clean. But in this case, they weren't clean because there was no servant at the door to just dust off the feet. It was a social faux pas. It was a problem. It was an omission. It was an oops. So what should have happened is somebody there should have said, I'll pick up the trash. Oh, I'll get it. I'll go park the car. I will. No, none of them did it because they had to look important and important people, significant people. Well, they don't serve other people. They demand, they impress, they posture. And so Jesus took off his outer garment, his robe, because you wouldn't want to get that dirty, picked up a towel and began to wash his disciples' feet to show them the most important person in the group serving like the least important person. So we picked the story up. When he finished washing their feet, he put back on his clothes, his robe and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you should also wash another's feet. Now for you, you're thinking foot washing. We even had a message about this not too long ago where I talked to you about how custom, it was different. Customs were different, right? And for us, it represents different things. And for, you know, the disciples are thinking, man, Jesus, what are you talking about? We get the foot washing. We get that there should have been a servant, but what are, you, what are you actually trying to say to us right now? You ever thought one thing, somebody else is saying another and you just don't connect. You don't, you're trying to listen, but not really trying to listen. They're not saying anything to reinforce your bias. And so they're having a hard time right now, even tracking with Jesus because he's saying something that seems like crazy talk. And he says, listen, you call me teacher, the person who teaches you truth what to believe and how to live. And you call me Lord, the person who's in charge of your life. 
and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should do the same thing for other people. I've set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And then this verse 17 is the verse that I want you to take with you into our time of singing and to help prepare you for our time of application in about 15 or 20 minutes. Jesus says something important to his disciples that was important then, and it was important now. Now, when Jesus spoke, it was translated into Greek, which was translated into English, which sometimes means that we miss some nuances that are important. And I try to only explain the nuances to you when they're important. And there's a nuance in here that's really, really important. So here we go. Jesus says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And so in my notes, I have parentheses around three sections of this statement, this scripture. Now that you know was constructed in a way that was definite, that was for sure, that there was no if, and, or but about it. When you know the truth, now that you know the truth, since you've heard the truth, period, exclamation point, done. That was it. There was no wiggle room in that statement. You will be blessed, a promise that is absolutely going to happen, that doesn't expire, that continues as long as you're faithful to the command. And then here's the point I want you to focus on now, if you do them. In my notes, I have parentheses around if you do. Because Jesus says now that you know, and it's definite, and it's no wiggle room, and it's absolute. And then he says, if you choose to do them, it's up to you. I won't make you. I can teach you, I can show you, but I can't force you. So if you know what to do and you choose not to do it, it's on you. Perhaps we've decided that the story we're writing for our own life is better than the one Jesus can write. So we pick up the pen and we fill in the words. Or when we know what to do and we do it regardless of cost, well, that's when real, that's when real faith begins and the beginning of real spiritual life. So how are we gonna apply this? A thousand ways we could apply it. I mean, all sorts of ways. And I know you guys and you know me. And many of you I've spent some time with and the ones I haven't spent time with, I would love to spend time with, but I know you. And by knowing many of you and by knowing myself, then that helps me know most of you because many of us are connected by common themes and struggles and personalities and everything else. And here's one of the things that I think we have a problem with. And I don't mean just you or just Cap City Church or just Rick. I mean, we as being a Christian society, us. And I think we're spiritually lazy. I think we know what to do oftentimes, but we don't do it. And the reason is, I think we lie to ourselves. I think we lie to other people. And I think we lie to God. And by being willing to embrace truth and do what's right, we allow God to pick up the pen and to continue the story in your life, in your family's life, in our church, in our community, and ultimately in our world. And so my challenge is gonna to come to you from the book of Proverbs as we apply this specific thing. And I wanna share with you my own journey this week that's been a little bumpy and I can't wait to do it. All right, we're gonna learn about ourselves. We're gonna learn a little bit about lying and, um, and hopefully we're gonna do a little changing. So my goal is that we all decide 
that if we see ourselves a little relationally, spiritually lazy, where we may not be trusting God by not telling God the truth, ourselves the truth or others the truth, that we would have the courage to live a different way. We all lie. If you don't think you lie, uh, I'd like to meet you. I'm not gonna call you a liar now, but I want us to talk for a minute and then I'll probably suggest you are. All of us have a tendency to shade the truth. You know, I like um, Amazon, I told you that, but after the greed message last week, I was returning some things. And um, you know, not that I bought a ton of stuff, just stuff I don't really need that seems good in the moment. And the beautiful part about returning stuff to Amazon is you can go to Kohl's and you go, if you live here in Ankeny or the area, you know, if you're online, it's a department store and you can just walk up to the counter and you just hand them your, you know, your item and you let them scan a little code on your phone and they take it back. And then all of a sudden there's money back on your credit card, which feels so good, almost like you're saving, but in reality, you're just reverse spending. And so I was taking some stuff back. And as I was at the counter in Kohl's and they're doing a remodel in Ankeny Kohl's, which is always a problem when you know where you're going and then you walk in one day and you don't. And everything now is at the front counter where they have the Amazon return counter and then they have everybody else that's checking out. So I'm standing up there and uh, ready to return my item. And there's a kid working. I don't know, he's like 12. They all look like they're 12, don't they? The older you get, everybody looks like they're 12. Um, and he was probably, I don't know, high school or college age. And you know, there were tons of people around. I'm just in a hurry to, to get going. And he looked at me and he goes, hey. And I'm like, hey. And he talks really loud. He goes, how much do you bench press? And um, I looked at him and that was the weirdest question in the world. There was no context, there was no relationship. It was just a weird question. And you know what I immediately wanted to do was to lie. <laughs> there was a number that came to mind and it was exactly 10 pounds heavier or more than the real number. It wasn't a huge lie, it was just a little lie. It was a 10 pound lie. But to me, it seemed like the appropriate number to give this kid who's asking me in front of all these people who could care less, right? But are just trying to get their day done. And I was faced with the decision. My first response, just nudge the truth a little bit. Who cares? Now, fortunately, I remembered, I'm working on a message. And part of this message is gonna be about lying. So I need to make sure when I stand up here and talk to my friends, I haven't done something as dumb as that. And so I ask a different question. I said, instead of answering his question, why are you asking me? And he goes, oh, well, you know, I've just started working out. And so we had a whole conversation where I had to, I got to avoid answering the question entirely, got my money back on my card and I left. But how easy is it for us to lie? Sometimes we lie to get out of trouble. Sometimes we lie to make ourselves look better. Sometimes we lie just because it's part of our nature and it's disgusting. Let me tell you about it. Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs, the author of Proverbs, the Holy Spirit inspired him to give us some insight into the heart of God. And in this insight, he says, the Lord detests lying lips, but delights in those who tell the truth. Now I love the way it's alliterated in the English. The Lord detests lying lips, but delights in the truth. And it's almost rhythmic, isn't it? But this is what it means. The word detests. The word detests means like when you eat something. The other day for breakfast, I was eating a handful of mixed nuts and most of them are really good. But every once in a while you get a rotten nut and you eat it. And when it's in your mouth, it's just disgusting. And you know, if you swallow it, that things are gonna be bad. And so you spit out the entire mouthful of Nuts, just because there's one in there that's just, I mean, nasty. Well, that's what this word means. That It's like God himself makes him sick to his stomach, like he's eating something bad and he has to get rid of it, that he detests lying lips, the kind of lips that lie to God, the kind of lips that lie to others, the kind of lips that lie to themselves. But he delights, just like it sounds, and those who tell the truth, Proverbs 12, 22. The Bible says Satan is the father of lies. He's always hated the truth. In the book of John, John chapter eight, verse 44, we read this. The Satan is the father of lies. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
that we're never more like Satan himself than when we are lying to God, lying to ourselves and lying to others. That if we wanna be like Satan, then we need to be liars. Wow, that is a big deal. I mean, the 10 commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness. I mean, it's in there in the Bible, but does he really take it this seriously? Is it possible? Well, there's all sorts of reasons that we do it. Let's just kind of prime the pump here before we really get into it. One is we say it's to protect other people. Well, perhaps, but usually not. We say it's to protect other people or relationships, but in reality, it's just to protect ourselves. That's a lie we tell ourselves. To protect ourselves, oftentimes. Is it human nature? Yeah. To preserve ourselves at all costs? To avoid conflict and trouble? To impress other people? Recent studies show that over 60% of people lie to someone within the first 10 minutes of meeting them. I hadn't talked to this guy at Kohl's more than 30 seconds and I was ready to tell him a 10 pound lie <laughs> to impress some kid and a whole bunch of people who could care less. But there it was, just pop it out. To avoid responsibility, to avoid the truth and to continue to embrace the reality that we've created and we say is true. To avoid conflict. Marriage is important. And because it's important, I have made it my life's goal to make sure that the longer that Joy and I live together, the more we love each other, the more effective we are as a team, and that in the next 30 or 35 years, as we finish our lives together, that it's far better than it's ever been. And I'm not saying it's bad, but it's a living, breathing partnership that as two people grow together as one becomes something more beautiful and useful to God that every day should be stronger and better than the day before. But I am human and my wife is a little less than, you know, I mean, she's better than me, but still human. And as she reminds me, we're both first children and we both have a strong will. And um, when two people live in close contact with each other, then there's conflict from time to time. And that shouldn't scare you. People who hide it should scare you. Dan and I grew up in an era of Christian professionals who hid the truth at all costs and created a fabricated idea of what life should be and gave people an unrealistic understanding of what scripture really is and even what Jesus expects. And the reality is that over 35 years of marriage, Joy and I have served the Lord the entire 35 years together, but there have been at least two times where we have come to the point in our life where we had to say to each other, we're either calling it quits or we're just gonna forget everything that's happened and we're going to stick it out. And we decided we were gonna stick it out. And I don't say that to brag. I say that because it's a choice that all of us have to make. And whatever happened yesterday, mistakes have been made, things have happened. That's not what I'm concerned about. What I wanna to talk to you about is what we do today and how we move forward. And I'm gonna be teaching a Bible study to men and men only on marriage and how we can become men of God no matter what we get or happens or see in return. And to do that, I need to learn and I need to be transparent and I need to share. And I also need to be honest. And that starts with my relationship closest to me, which is my wife. So we were watching Netflix the other night and she asked me a question and I lied to her. Does that surprise anybody? Did I have reasons? Well, probably. Were they good reasons? <laughs> At the time, they seemed like good reasons. It wasn't a big question. It wasn't like, you know, it would have caused this huge, I mean, we don't fight like that. You know, she wouldn't storm out of the house and take off and come back a day later. That's just not what we do. It was just easier for me not to tell her the truth. So I lied to her. I'd like to tell you at first service, I had a hard time admitting it. I was like, I nudged the truth a little. I shaded the truth a little bit. I mean, it wasn't a 10 pound lie. It was a one pound lie. It was a lie, I lied to her. So I woke up the next morning. Yeah, we watched TV, we were fine. You know, I had a great night. Next morning, woke up, prayed the prayer. I pray every morning. God, let me see today what I need to see because if I don't see it, I'm gonna miss it. 
Let me see the people, the opportunities. Let me say what you want. Let me stand for truth. Let me embrace the truth. And I was impressed in my spirit that I shouldn't be worried about missing it today. I should be worried about what I missed yesterday. And I knew I had to go say to my wife, I lied to you and I'm sorry, which you think would be the easiest thing to do in the world is to confess to your wife or your husband, but it's sometimes or often the hardest thing. So I went to my wife and I said to her, listen, yesterday when you asked me that question, I lied to you. And she said, I know. <laughs> How do you guys know? How do you know? How do you know? I mean, I, I, I never know, I, I never, but she knew. And so then it made me a little upset. And I'm like, if you knew, why didn't you tell me? Why did you withhold the truth from me? Well, it was just too much trouble for me to tell you that I knew and I didn't want any conflict. I just wanted to watch TV. So at first, as I'm thinking, I'm like, why would you disrespect me to the point where you wouldn't think I could change, where you wouldn't think I would hear that. Why wouldn't you? And I forgot about the fact that I had lied in the first place. <laughs> Righteous indignation. And then I asked a question from her that I think came from the Holy Spirit. And I said, wait a second, what is it in me that makes it hard for you or for you to feel unsafe, you know, in smooth and peaceful sailing in our relationship? Why, why, to tell me the truth. What is it? Now, you ask that kind of a question to your spouse. If they're in a bad mood, you pick the wrong time, they'll either go stone silent or they will give you far more than you ask for. So timing is everything. But you wanna do something courageous, sit down with your spouse if you have one, with your girlfriend, boyfriend, partner and ask them, what's it like to be married to me? And I asked her, we were driving and I encouraged her and she shared with me. And you know what? Some of it was good and some of it was constructive and I didn't like it, but it was true. And I wanted to hear the truth because in the truth or with the truth is the only place you can find intimacy, the only place you can find connection. And it's the only way that God can write the story Let's keep moving. Three ways that we lie. Number one, not telling God the truth. You mean, what do you mean we don't tell God the truth? We try to lie to God all the time. We do it in prayer. We manage the relationship. You probably do it from time to time. We want God to think better of us than, you know, the truth really is. And so oftentimes we position ourselves in different ways. God knows that's a different message for a different day, but needs to be said, just being honest with God. He knows our feelings. He knows our heart. He can stand our disappointment. He can stand our joy. He can enjoy us and, and celebrate with us when we're celebrating. He can cry and mourn with us when we're sad. He controls the outcome of our life. But yet sometimes we don't trust him enough to be honest with him. We have to be honest with others. Now, just because it's true, this isn't in your notes, this is important. Just because it's true doesn't mean you have to say it. And there's some of us, I say us because I mean you, because I hope I don't do this, but then I hope you don't either. So I'll just go back to us. Some of us think it's our spiritual gift just to lay truth on people because they need to hear it. And um, just because it's true doesn't mean it's your right to say it, doesn't mean it's your responsibility to say, and it doesn't mean it's, it's wise. You don't have to say it. And in some cases, that's not a lie, it's just wisdom. But there are often cases with people, particularly those closest to you, that they can't hear the truth from anybody else except you. So you must choose whether you stand up and do what you feel like you need to do or whether you look the other way. And sometimes we're just afraid of the consequences. Sometimes we would just rather avoid conflict and we would just rather take the easy way out, that we would just rather be, be lazy. Isn't that amazing? I said it wasn't in my notes and from the first service to the second service, it all of a sudden magically ended up in my notes. Somebody up there, man, Jared is, he's on it, you know, that's really good. I didn't put it in my notes, but Jared did for your viewing pleasure. And now you don't have to worry about uh, remembering that. This is hard stuff. 
not telling yourself the truth is really the third thing and where I want to drill down. Now, let's go back to the idea of marriage. Let's go back to this, this example, because Joy and I, as we were talking, and I told her, I said, listen, I'm working. I've got a whole bunch of guy friends. Many of us have relationships. Uh, we need to be men of God. Doesn't really matter what we're getting back in return. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not great. That really doesn't matter. We're going to be men of God. We're going to be men who, if my granddaughter were to marry somebody like us, I would be really happy. That, my friends, that standard is high. And so uh, Joy and I are talking about it. And it's not like that I'm making her share and that I'm making her, you know, I mean, this is me. I'm working on me. She's responsible for her. We work together, we grow. And we were talking about our marriage and, and we were talking about, you know, strengths and weaknesses and the years and the time and the, you know, the stuff that we've dealt with. And, and we said, um, well, Joy, you know, I said, I don't see me clearly. I'm me. And I said, you don't see you clearly, you're you. How much do we want truth? And she's like, I don't know. And I said, who is it that knows us and has seen our marriage more clearly than anybody else in this entire world? And she looked at me and she said, our boys. And I said, do you wanna text them and do you wanna ask them what they think about our marriage? If we want the truth and we wanna grow, so we did. That's what we do. I don't know. When your kids leave home, you have things to do like this. So you turn off the Netflix and you ask questions. And so I worded the question and Joy helped me. And I just texted them out of the blue because, um, you know, I didn't want to give them a warning and I wanted them to be honest. And, you know, we text every day, my boys and I. I mean, oftentimes we talk, we're best friends. And I love that about, about our relationship. They're men, they're independent, they do their own thing, but yet they allow me to be part of their lives. And it's a privilege. So me texting them or calling them is not unusual. Uh, however, my text to them was unusual. I said, guys, I need you to tell me the truth. That's how I started it off. Mom and I are talking. First of all, nothing's wrong. We're not splitting up, right? Nothing's wrong. We're talking. And it, they know I'm preparing for a message. And, you know, I've asked weird questions before. And I said, listen, can you do me a favor? I said, we want to see us through your eyes. Can you tell me some things that you've observed when you were growing up and also as adults that you want to have in your relationship and your marriage? And will you also please tell me some things that you've seen in your life or in our lives and in our marriage that you don't want to see in your marriage or repeat it. And that's it, I just sent the text. And this was in the evening and they're doing their thing and, and Joy and I are like, what do you think's gonna happen? <laughs> we were scared and it was like taking a test you hadn't studied for, we didn't know. But we could invalidate it and go, well, our kids don't know. Well, they're gonna, what they're gonna say is wrong, they don't know us. But the reality is, is that what better mirror than to hold up truth from somebody that's seen you, two different people, for years and years and years. So we waited and it was like over an hour before they texted back. And, you know, um, you know I had one son who answered and, you know, he was very sweet and, you know, he never would wanna say anything that, you know, he thought would hurt mom or dad. And, and I had the other son that's like, why do you wanna know? <laughs> and so... <laughs> I texted back and I'm like, look, man, this is a no, you know, no strings attached. I mean, if you got something to say, let it go. It's for your dad's growth. Um, yeah, I'm going to be hanging with a group of men at some point in the near future. And I need to know how you see me. We're going to grow together. And, uh, and so he waited a while and then he sent a text back. And you know, it was mostly good, but it wasn't all good. And the stuff that he told me and the stuff that he shared with his mom was stuff that I immediately felt defensive about. And it wasn't a big deal. I'm not even gonna tell you what it is right now because I didn't ask his permission to tell you. But I wanted to tell him he's wrong. Well, you didn't see me accurately. Well, son, we went through times where there was lots of stress and all the kinds of stuff we can say, but we just let it settle. And we're like, what a gift for somebody who loves us and knows us to trust us enough and just lay it out there. And we had made a decision that we wanted truth more than we wanted the deception that we could create for ourselves. If we're the only ones deciding what truth really is. Does anyone resonate with that? It's a big part of life and it can be a big sign of laziness. It just gets to the point where we'd rather believe the lies than we would really reveal the truth. And it's really, really, significant because self-deception enables us to not have to change. 
or to admit that we're really bad people and just really don't care. So I walked away last week with a little bit of work to do, which I wasn't surprised about, but I'm gonna embrace because I'm not in it as a sprint and neither are you. We're growing together and we're gonna do this until the day we die. The last face I see when I leave this earth behind, the statistics show is gonna be that beautiful face of my wife. And if not, I might be the last one she sees. Why not? We're a spiritual family, we grow together. So what does Ephesians tell us? It says, instead, we will speak the truth and not with hatred or with the desire to destroy or divide or to get even or to be vindictive, but we will speak the truth in what? Can you read that next word? Love, and the word there is agape love, which we spent nine weeks or however many weeks it was talking about together over the summer-ish time. That we will speak the truth in love so that we can grow every way in our relationships closest to us, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a family relationship, a friendship, whether it's a city group, whether it's a church community, it's the only way we affect the world around us and the only way God has the pen and can write our story. We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like who? Like Jesus, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy, and growing and full of what? Love. You guys say that like, you know, I mean, that's a good thing, isn't it? It's what we want. But if we'd rather take the easy way out or to create a false reality to avoid conflict or to reinforce our own personal bias in narrative to the point where we don't really know where the truth ends and lies begin, then we can continue the cycle. And there's one word that comes to mind to embrace um, this way of thinking. Courageous. Because so far, as we've worked through the last seven weeks, as your friend and as your pastor, nothing has scared me more, but nothing has been as rewarding. Can't wait to share more with you guys. All right, let's finish this up. God delights in truth. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. Proverbs 12, 22, B, you may wanna remember that one this week. The reasons we lie to God, to others, and to ourselves is because we don't trust him. He can't create it. He can't fix it. He can't do it. So we'll do it for him. What if the story of your life that God is writing is far more beautiful than the one that you have chosen to write for yourself. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent together. This series has been so much fun in a, well, I guess a weird kind of way, but we wanna grow. And you know, my prayer has been that over this last eight weeks, that if any of my friends here or joining us online or the other service have taken anything away and applied it to their lives and taken a step forward in their faith, that every single thing is worth it. All of the prayer, all of the preparation, all of the production, that it's all worth it because that's why we do it. And that as we take baby steps forward in our faith, we're being transformed, no longer being conformed to the image of the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds, thinking and living a different way. I thank you for the year that we have spent together. For those who are just joining us, the day, the weeks, or the months we've spent, for the celebration that lies in wait in just a couple of months from now. 
And I thank you most of all that you complete the work you began in us, that you love us and you won't quit on us, even when we deserve it. I pray that with gratitude and in humility and ultimately in Jesus' name, amen.